share the podium with Packy for just 60 seconds. Being from Los Angeles, I always embrace the entertainment industry. How can they make those great films, produce that music? That creativity is fabulous. Well, the speech that Packy's going to give to you today would sound like something Hollywood couldn't even write, and it's the truth. But before Packy starts, I want two very courageous men here today to stand in the back of the room. And I'd like all of you attending to look at two gentlemen, John Thayer and Scotty Smith, please stand, who are courageously for fighting for justice for the tunnel workers. Excellent. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you all for, for being here and attending. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a paper that was written by myself, uh, co-authored by uh, Linda and, so, and, and, and also by my wife. Um, and so I, I'd like to thank them, of course, for their contributions to this paper as well. Uh, without them, it, it never would be finished. Um, Briefly, uh, citations, I'll be glad to provide these to anybody afterwards if you want to go and find this. It's currently published uh, in an online first. Uh, it will be forthcoming in a hard copy of the International Journal of Critical Criminology. Uh, this particular uh, incident really drives home some, uh, some facts about white-collar crime that really allow me to dispel many of the myths about white-collar crime. And I only want to touch on these very briefly, uh, but it's very important, the idea that uh, white-collar crime is not a serious problem. Um, we've heard uh, other speakers talking about uh, essentially uh, activities that have been described by many of my colleagues who do work in in uh, criminal justice, uh, describing uh, the activities of Johns Mansville, for example, as, as, as crime, uh, and, and that's really what they are. Uh, white collar crime only causes financial harm. Uh, this is a, an enormous myth. I, I, I spent a lot of time with students talking about crimes, and of course they jump right to Enron and maybe Martha Stewart, and they think of these uh, activities with, um, men in sport coats stealing money from individuals and they, they don't really think about uh, the physical costs and the physical harms that are inflicted by uh, white collar crimes as well. Uh, also the harms caused by white collar crime are insignificant compared to street crime. Uh, whether you're talking about financial uh, crimes or you're talking about financial harms or you're talking about physical harms uh, including death and serious injury, uh, the activities of white collar offenders far outweigh those of uh, your average street crime or uh, collectively of street crimes. Um, I, I need to talk briefly about uh, what is a state crime because you notice the title of the paper talks about a state crime and if you're not in the world of, of white collar crime that may sound strange and uh, a state crime is nothing more than a, a crime that is sponsored by the state. State is a generic term for uh, the government or a government agency. This is an example of a state crime as the architect of the capital is a governmental agency that makes it a state crime. Um, the way that we conceptualize this as a state crime fits very well with uh, plenty of literature out there talk, talk about talking about and documenting various other forms of state crimes that have existed you know for for years and years. So uh, a few citations. I'll be glad to, again, uh, share any other information uh, about this literature with anybody who might be interested. Um, the crime that I want to talk a little bit about uh, involves a, a group of gentlemen, uh, primarily gentlemen, who refer to themselves affectionately as the tunnel rats. Uh, two of them were, were introduced to you at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, they're also known as the Capital Power Plant Tunnel Crew. And what this paper alleges is that the members of the tunnel crew were systematically misled by their employer who was well aware of the risks to their personal health and safety. This resulted in their exposure to a harmful work environment, including the exposure to asbestos for a period of years. Uh, I want to point out that uh, the exposure to asbestos was just one of the many things that was uh, in their work environment that was harmful, that their employer knew was there. Um, and um, that is what we're calling a crime. Again, it's important that I say alleges for a couple of reasons. Um, nobody's ever been uh, arrested for this. Nobody's ever been, obviously if they haven't been arrested, they haven't been put on trial, nobody's ever been convicted. Uh, it's also important I want you to think about uh, alleges. I want you to think about that word because I'm gonna share with you the source of my information. I'm gonna share with you the information that I have and I'll let you make the decision for yourself as whether or not you feel as though the employers knew about these and whether or not you think these things are, uh, should be constituted as a crime. 
Uh, the tunnel crew, essentially what they were charged with was maintaining five, gra five miles of underground utility tunnels. They supply the hot and cold water as well as uh, warm air in the winter and cool air in the summer to Congress and to some of the federal office buildings, including the Supreme Court. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Alan Hantman was the acting architect of the Capitol until February of 2007 uh, when he retired amidst the scandal of uh, citations that were issued in 2006. They were not the first citations that were issued to his uh, to his organization, but um, these were these citations were particularly troubling, as we'll see in a moment when I when I actually talk about these uh, citations that were issued in 2006. Uh, it's important to note. Um, the OOC was established in 1995 by the Congressional Accountability Act. Uh, it's important to note that because the OOC is the agency responsible for monitoring these uh, facilities and ensuring that they are a, a safe place to work and, and essentially that they are in compliance with uh, the OSHA Act, which uh, prior to uh, the uh, Congressional Accountability Act, uh, the OSHA Act did not cover but these federal employees along with a, a whole host of other federal employees. So the OSHA Act is important and the OOC is, is important to acknowledge them uh, as it's their duty to in, ensure that uh, the architect of the Capitol is in compliance with that OSHA Act. Um, the OOC, so I'm, I'm gonna provide you again with some evidence of uh, knowledge about the exposure to asbestos and a variety of other um, potential uh, threats to personal safety for these workers and uh, these items that I'm going to talk about actually come from uh, a summary of uh, citations, memorandums, um, other reports that were actually written um, by various agencies, but the OOC actually put this summary uh, together, and so let me share some of those with you. Um, before I do that, let me also uh, take a moment to note that according to the members of the tunnel crew, uh, some of whom worked in the tunnels for more than 20 years, they were never provided uh, with any protections from asbestos or other harmful substances present in their workplace. Uh, there were also never any procedures for decontamination after, after work. Um, so what is my evidence? The evidence that I have, um, and I'll, I'll sort of read here, I'm gonna read through this relatively quickly. On June 30th of 2000, a certified industrial hygienist prepared a memorandum. The subject of the memorandum was tunnel hazards not identified by Army Corps of Engineer Inspection. The memorandum included a narrative with pictures concerning friable asbestos. Uh, on December 7th of 2000, the OOC issued a citation noting three specific violations requiring immediate abatement action by the office of the AOC. Immediate abatement. Um, these three citations, uh, although none of them recognize asbestos, they do recognize other um, harmful working conditions that were, that were present. Uh, employees working in the utility tunnels are exposed to hazards likely to cause death or serious physical harm, including layers or chunks of concrete falling from the ceiling without warning. Uh, the failure to provide communication equipment necessary to enable continuous monitoring of the status of employees assigned to work in permit confined spaces. And uh, other violations noting that there are long stretches in the utility tunnels where employees are unable to evacuate the tunnels to the streets in the case of an emergency without the assistance from outside rescuers. Uh, another warning came in July of 2001 in the form of a report on fire safety from the Office of the General Counsel. The report includes a narrative with pictures concerning friable asbestos and a narrative about lead exposure in the tunnels. In August of 2005, a health and safety consultant retained by the Office of General Counsel in 1999 issued a report to the head of safety, uh, Alan Hantman. Uh, the cover letter and the attached 31-page report entitled OSH 9011 Status of Heat and Stress and Asbestos Hazards in the Utility Tunnels reports uh, a variety of violations, including descriptions of violations related to heat stress and asbestos. Finally, in January uh, of 2006, the General Counsel for the OOC sent a cover letter and new citations for heat, stress, and asbestos to the uh, architect of the Capitol. Um, these new citations were actually followed in February by um, the same agency, the OOC, uh, a letter from the general counsel to Hantman, as well as a 15-page legal complaint describing the items that were not abated or not taken care of from the citations that were actually issued in 2000. Uh, essentially what they said is, we issued citations in 2000, now it's 2006. Uh, they were forced to file a legal complaint to say, you never actually repaired any of the items that we identified in our citations in 2000. Um, John Thayer actually testified before Congress actually in 2007 stating, 
employment, uh, the Capitol Police refused to patrol the tunnels out of concern for their officers and for the safety of their dogs. The fire department, the DC fire department, will not attempt an emergency rescue in the tunnels, but will only come as a body recovery because there are no communication systems and access is extremely limited. He's describing the same environment that these guys um, went into on a daily basis to, to actually uh, perform their job and to, to work. Um, I'm here to, to tell you that this case, uh, much like other cases that have occurred, is in fact a crime. Willful exposure of employees to unsafe conditions is a crime. Uh, first successfully prosecuted in the year 1986, uh, Stefan Golob, a gentleman who died as a result of cyanide exposure in his work environment. Um, however, I'm also here to tell you that prosecution is not the norm. Uh, David Barstow completed an article in 2003 looking at uh, 1,242 instances of worker deaths as a result of willful safety violations by an employer between 1982 and 2002. Um, despite having been found uh, willful and intentional uh, violations of the rules resulting in death, 93% of these cases were not prosecuted and the decision not to prosecute was upheld even when administrative judges found abundant proof of willful wrongdoing. Uh, this is a problem as well. Uh, these these situations, these types of uh, uh, activities are criminal and uh, are rarely treated or viewed as such.